Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our Combibis webinar on bioplastics. Is this a new sustainability challenge in a circular economy? This is the question we want to discuss uh, with our two speakers today. It's Delphine Levy-Alvarez from Zero Waste Europe and Karsten Bachholz from European Environmental Bureau. My name is Sylvia Schreiber. I'm from CombiBase and I will moderate this session. I welcome very much uh, Delphine Levy-Alvarez. She is uh, from France and she is Product Policy Officer at Zero Waste Europe in Brussels. She is an author of the Zero Waste Scenario and she holds a master degree in sustainable engineering. I also welcome very much Karsten Wachholz. Karsten Wachholz is also working in Brussels as Senior Policy Officer on Resources Conservation and Product Policy. He is uh, working for the European Environmental Bureau, EEB, and he worked uh, before in the headquarters of the German NGO NABU, its Naturschutzbund. Deutschland. Very welcome, you both. Before I uh, uh, hand over the floor to you, I want to give you a short introduction, uh, introduction on the first slide, what it is when we talk about bioplastics. Next slide, please. So, seven things you should know about bioplastics. Plastic is the workhorse of the global economy. Since 1964, the production has multiplied by 20. But given the projected and unchanged growth in plastic consumption in the next 30 years, the entire plastics industry will consume 20% of total oil production and 15% of annual carbon budget because most plastic is still fossil and petroleum based. Plastic materials' main drawbacks are therefore the unsustainable use of fossil resources and the high volumes non-multitude uh, uh, circular um, use and most projects, uh, products end leaking into our ecosystems. By 2015 there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish said world record sailor Ellen MacArthur during a recent World Economic Forum. Bioplastics is thought to be an alternative, but yet only 2% of all produced polymers are bio-based and only 5% of all plastics are recycled effectively. Oh, I see the camera is... Sorry, I, I, I'm switching me off, yes. So, bioplastics is thought to be an alternative uh, to uh, uh, conventional plastics, but yet only 2% of all produced polymers are bio-based and only 5% of all plastics are recycled effectively. The prefix bio means that these plastic materials are from biological sources, such as plants, straw, waste, or even bacteria, but the prefix bio does neither say anything about the real shares of green material in the polymer, nor does it indicate its biodegradability. So, is it a bluff pack package? This is a question I hand over to Delphine. Please take the floor. Thank you, Sylvia. Good morning, everybody. Um, so, I'm Delphine Villalais, I work for Zero West Europe and together with Karsten today we're going to explore a bit the topic of bioplastics and this new sustainability challenge uh, in the circular economy debate. Next slide, please. So, just to give you a bit of background, um, we are, uh, so we are different NGOs, but we are working together in this coalition of NGOs called Break Free from Plastic. Uh, it's the short name, but it's basically Break Free from Plastic Pollution. So, it's a campaign that has been launched it's in, in September 2016. Uh, and at the beginning, we were 90 organizations from all over the world. And now it's more than 800 organizations uh, working together and implementing a, a common strategy to tackle plastic pollution globally. In Europe, uh, Zero Waste Europe has initiated uh, 
started the movement and we are now 20 NGOs and networks of NGOs like EB uh, working together um, to make um, innovative proposals uh, for the decision-making process but also to raise awareness among citizens, decision makers and, and businesses to, uh, to substantially reduce um, plastic use, uh, increase reuse and work to reduce plastic pollution. Next slide, please. So on the specific topic of bioplastics, uh, if there are five key messages that you need to take away today from this webinar, the first one should be, would be that we really need to have a clear distinction between compostable plastics and bio-based materials because right now when we talk about bioplastics, we talk about a bit of everything. Uh, biodegradable, compostable plastics that are not necessarily bio-based, but also bio-based materials that are not necessarily compostable or biodegradable. So we really need uh, to, to clarify all that, especially for the consumer. Uh, the second key message is that before even thinking about substitution uh, with renewable feedstock, with plastics from you know, renewable feedstock, we really need to look at prevention and see how we can tackle single-use, uh, some single-use plastics and, and throw away practices. This is the priority for us before, even before I ha highlighting renewable materials and biodegradability. The third one would be uh, that we really need to evaluate indirect impacts of a switch to bio-based material uh, through competitive use of feedstock and ensure their traceability from the very beginning before scaling up the demand. Uh, it goes back to all the to the debate on sustainability criteria, but we'll come back to that later. And the fourth one should be that Producer responsibility uh, is an important uh, principle that needs to be applied also to bioplastics. And it means for us that bio-based plastics should be designed and collected for reuse and mechanical recycling, and that there should be an integration of this new stream, uh, I would say, uh, in the existing system. And uh, the last one, but not the least, uh, is that biodegradable plastics require a complete integration into an in industrial composting system. That's really important for us. Uh, and, and Karsten will come back to that later. Next slide, please. And I give the floor to Karsten. I think I, I come back to composting immediately. So we will work through the four, five issues, which we just, uh, that. Delphine has just introduced to you in a bit of more detail uh, and I'll start from the bottom with composting. So our major concern is that there is a lot of talk, especially in the research and innovation communities about full biodegradability that you finally can manage uh, to, that plastics will degrade in soils or even in the marine environment. And to our knowledge that doesn't materialize yet and there's a huge risk that plastics just break down into smaller parts and make the plastic pollution in uh, the environment, in the seas and finally in the food chain even more complicated to track and to resolve. So we see though uh, a solution, a potential solution uh, in, in terms of biodegradability for known recyclable waste but that uh, requires to our understanding that we need to make sure that we establish separate collection and treatment for bio waste in the first place and for the time being we think as long as you can't control the conditions like temperature, like pressure, like humidity, acidity or other uh, conditions, um, it's, you cannot guarantee that it uh, decomposes in a proper way. So we think the best way is to currently concentrate handling these materials in industrial composting facilities. Um, taking this into account, uh, we are convinced that there is only a limited range of very specific applications for biodegradable uh, plastics and uses, uh, such as, for instance, bio-waste collection bags, fast food packaging, which are uh, contaminated through um, nutrients, uh, and uh, certain applications in the agriculture se uh, sector like mulch films. And the main safeguard we want to emphasize is that you must ensure that there is no cross-contamination of other waste streams which are collected for recycling. So we see more and more public procures, for instance, looking for events uh, demanding biodegradability uh, um, 
uh, uh, cutlery and stuff like that and then it's collected in a mixed waste stream with known biodegradable uh, materials so that doesn't help us materializing the environmental benefit of those materials. Next slide please. So this uh, chart doesn't tell you much about design, how to design bio-based plastics for recycling, but uh, it was an indication for us uh, how you should look at you into novel materials such as bioplastics from a circular economy uh, perspective. So the report which you can download from the Green Alliance um, uh, website which is a member organization of the European Environmental Bureau um, basically had a look at what are the main reasons why certain bioplastics have been developed and introduced to the market. And as you can see there's a huge emphasis on biodegradability where we Point just, I just pointed out that we think this is has a limited benefit. So there is a lot of interest in looking into waste feedstocks, which obviously have also not, due to many problems, not materialized yet. And there should be, to, according to us, a major focus on how to ensure the recyclability. And I think uh, the reason why we want to stress that is uh, the the use of renewable materials should not be an excuse to neglect designed for recycling. If we use those materials only one time for single use and then throw it away, uh, even if the, re uh, the feedstock might be renewable in some uh, uh, on natural terms, uh, we are still not resource efficient. So we struggle with plastic recycling in general, um, but we don't want to uh, even go back uh, through introducing new materials which um, um, are not compatible with our recycling systems. So for bio-based materials, the first question we need to raise is um, do we have to separate them at when it comes to the end of life? Um, uh, there are two ways, either um, the, the volumes are still too low and we can tolerate for a kind of transition period a, a contamination of a different uh, material stream as long as they are compatible with the recycling processes we have in place. Um, uh, but certainly there will be a certain threshold where we cannot move on with that and then you either have to invest into specific sorting technologies for separation and there might be even uh, the necessity to build up uh, recycling infrastructure um, uh, for those materials such as we have currently the issues with PLA and to some extent with PEF. Next slide please. I think I hand back to um, Daphne please. Thank you. Um, so yeah, the, the, the third main concern we have is about the sustainability of feedstock, of re these renewable feedstocks. And of course, uh, as environmental NGOs, we are advocating uh, strongly to reduce our reliance to fossil fuel. Um, so that's why looking at renewable feedstock is interesting. It's interesting. But what's important for us is that we, that we develop criteria to ensure sustainability of bio-based materials. Um, we, if we look at those potential criteria, <clears throat> the first one uh, would be that in any case uh, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be competing with food grabs. We really need to look at uh, second or third generation uh, bio-based materials. Uh, we don't want to fall into the same tricks as we've fallen uh, with biofuels. Um, we really want also to optimize land and water use and really look at uh, possibilities to, to, to use contaminated land or, or things like that that couldn't, used, that couldn't be used for, uh, for uh, food, uh, food crops. And uh, we know that there are some experiments, but it's still only experiments. And uh, water use and especially GMO use and pesticide use is also some, like, very important concern for us. Uh, we are not working on waste only. We are trying to work uh, not in silos and really looking at all the impacts. So, um, so it, like growing uh, bio-based materials would have an impact on other sectors, like sectors as, as agriculture and so on. So it's really important to look at at, at it caref carefully and not just think that it's a silver bullet that's going to solve everything. 
and and for that uh, it's really important to establish chain of custody certification schemes and verification methods uh, for also for bio-based contents uh, in articles. We don't want to, Carson will come back to that later, but uh, we want to prevent any false green claim uh, that this is bio-based and, and, and actually there is almost no, no, no there is almost nothing bio-based in the product. So there, there should be like clear uh, certification schemes for that. Uh, next slide, please. And ready for us, the priority, and I'm going to end with that, is prevention of plastic pollution. So really looking at the plastic stream today, the plastic waste stream today, and uh, not thinking directly, oh, what could we replace by re renewable feedstock and bio-based material? Uh, but looking at it firstly with this idea of what can we phase out? Uh, what products could be uh, could be transformed or what products uh, could be um, phased out if they are not useful, if they are not necessary, uh, what system, systems we have to redesign to allow reuse, especially if we look at packaging, for example, but, and for other products, how we can expand the lifespan and, and if plastic is really the most relevant material to produce them, uh, how can we phase out toxics in these plastics? How can we improve recyclability uh, and expand the lifespan of the product, uh, being able to replace the spare parts and so on? So really like looking at all these aspects to, to prevent plastic use uh, at the beginning and then to, to prevent plastic pollution with systems like take-back schemes and deposit reference systems. Um, so that, that's, that's the priority. And then comes looking at substitution. And then next and slide, the please. So a final issue that we want to raise with you in this webinar is about communication of green claims. So um, if you look at the logo at the top, something's claiming 100% biodegradable, it's natural material, whatever, you should think of how people might understand such a claim when they hear about bioplastics. Um, so there, we, we have some initial surveys and uh, um, uh, from consumer organizations that there is a lot of confusion around that. So they might even think because of the prefix bio that the feed stack stock used for these materials come from organic farming because that's what usually is labeled as bio. Um, they certainly have the expectation that this these materials decompose in the environment, so uh, we see a big risk that it basically encourages littering uh, because it, people might think it does do no harm, it will decompose anyway. And then also the term, the association with nature and natural materials might uh, be associated with uh, the issues of hazardous contents and uh, as you probably know it depends on uh, what do you add to your uh, material in terms of additives to the polymer uh, whether they are considered to be hazardous or not. So our recommendations, although they are, we acknowledge the potential uh, environmental assets those materials have, we are especially critical about everyone who advertises something as biodegradable in the environment. Um, we are also um, very much in favor not to single out one environmental aspects of a material product and focus the consumer communication only on that. So usually environmental NGOs are very much in favor of the use of multi-criteria eco-labels based on life cycle assessment but pointing out to the different and addressing the different dimensions including uh, recyclability and hazardous uh, contents for instance like the U flower, the Nordic swan or the blue angel. And then uh, if you want to communicate additionally on the specific properties of your material product you should clearly make it very clear under which conditions environmental benefits will materialize. That's why I introduced uh, the, the logo on the bottom, which is quite different in terms of messaging compared to what you see at the top. So we talk about compostable, we say where you have to put those materials and there is even an alert uh, that where, you, uh, where those systems uh, for separate collection of bio-waste do not exist, you should not throw it in your backyard compost. 
With that, I think the next slide just shows you again our contacts. Yeah, and then uh, I thank you for your attention and we are happy to receive some questions for discussion. Yes. Thank you very much, Karsten. Thank you very much, Delphine. I think it was a short and pointed uh, presentation. Uh, for all the listeners out there, you have a possibility to ask questions via your chat function or via your questions box. So please free, uh, be free to raise your hand uh, via written procedure and we will try to answer you then orally. Uh, meanwhile, I also have some questions uh, to uh, both uh, presenters. Uh, just to wrap up, if I understood right, there is currently no bioplastic 100% compostable, it's only under industrial conditions and these industrial conditions, my question is, this means we have to wait I think a certain uh, a given time of six weeks and we have to add some heat to decrease and de uh, degrade these plastics, is that right? Is these the industrial conditions you just mentioned during your last slide? Delphine, do you want to start? I can add up. Yes, Carsten, please, okay. if you have an answer to that. Or uh, Delphine, yes. Uh, yep. I think what's important to bear in mind is that you said that there is no 100% uh, compostable um, plastics. Composting is a process. It's a, it's a man managed process, I, I would say. So composting has to be done in, in industrial facilities or in some like proximity facilities, but Bioplastics should never go in your backyard or or uh, in your uh, community composting. It should always be managed in in bio in sorry in composting industrial composting plants, and and right now like bioplastic that comply with the European standard of biodegradability are suitable for biodegradation in a composting uh, centralized composting system. So I don't know if I, I think, answered your question. Yeah, maybe just to add on the issue of standards, I think they are crucial and there is a lot of um, standardization work going on for different applications. But as Delphine rightly mentioned, for industrial composting we have an uh, EU harmonized standard which then can be referenced for instance in a legislation on waste, how you deal with, uh, bi uh, with the treatment of bio-waste. So it's, it's not about only that the materials have those properties, it's also about whether the infrastructure and the systems for collecting and treating them are in place and that's certainly not the case all, all over Europe right now. Absolutely. And yeah. maybe just to just yeah. add a last thing, uh, some countries are developing a home composting uh, standard and uh, with the aim to, to certify bioplastics uh, for home composting. But uh, I mean this, this is definitely not the solution for us and actually every, every experiments that have been done of people putting bio-based bio plastic certified home composting in their home compost uh, are really not conclusive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so to put it in a nutshell, if I buy bioplastic and throw it on the, um, in the wood or to, into the uh, river or the sea, it will damage our ecosystem because it won't compost under these conditions. Whereas when I buy bioplastic and have a collection system which guarantees me that it will be composted, decomposed under industrial conditions, I can be sure I won't harm the environment. Is that right? It's, it's partially right. <laughs> Just one thing that is important is that we certainly don't want to have um, all single-use packaging that are now fossil fuel based plastics replaced by um, bio-based plastics uh, to enter the bio-waste separate collection scheme because the financial viability of this system uh, relies on the heavy density of this bio-waste. So mm -hmm. if you start putting massively lightweight, uh, low density plastic packaging, even if it's compostable, uh, mm -hmm. you're going you're gonna to harm the system. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you advocate, Delphine, in your NGO Zero Waste, 
uh, it's better to avoid waste and the use of plastic than just to switch the systems. Is it I mean, we all advocate for that. I think that prevention is the key and that, uh, as Karsten listed previously, there are some applications where bioplastics could be interested interesting and we are actually using a lot bio-based plastics for bio waste separate collection and also like there are some very specific cases like risk disaster management or things like that where you really have like you need to have quick answers or specific big scale events or yeah where it's more difficult to have reusable but reusable uh, for uh, because we talk about many cups, pla cups, plates and cutlery uh, when we think about bioplastics today uh, as single-use items. Uh, reusable should be the, the, the priority but sometimes, I mean, if it's fully integrated in a bio separate collection, it's okay. It doesn't represent like big quantities so it cannot harm the system the way I was describing just earlier but it's uh, just something that we need to flag uh, in case there is a, a, a a fast development of, of the of the yeah of the bioplastics industry. of the bioplastics. Therefore, yeah. also a, a follow-up question. I learned that Asia is catching up or even is surpassing Europe in the bioplastic sector because they have easy access to feedstock and so on. Are there discussions between Europe and Asia on what we are doing now? That it is, is the bioplastics is not uh, uh, only green; is all gold. You need to have these uh, pre uh, preconditions. What we are discussing now: collection systems and a clear labeling for consumers. Are there discussions with Asia, or do we need to be aware that there will come a flood of bioplastics, and the consumers could be well? I, I think a bit uh, not cheated but puzzled because they don't know how to handle that. Are there discussions between Europe and Asia to come to a common uh, a regulatory system and to a common labeling? Of, of course, at least in the NGO world uh, there are like a lot of discussions and in this global movement I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar we are in, co in close contact with many colleagues uh, and Zero Waste Europe has a global network of NGOs working on waste and for example China Zero Waste Alliance is really monitoring this question of uh, false uh, green claims because uh, what's also massive, what is also massively being developed there is oxo degradable uh, plastics and, and what is some oxo-degradable? Oxo what that, does it mean? Oxo-degradable is um, is something that is less, I mean, less and less put on the market in Europe, but where was really present a few years ago. It's a uh, plastic that that doesn't degrade, but that breaks down basically in very very tiny pieces. So you mm -hmm. could have the impression that it disappeared but actually it's still there in tiny tiny pieces and it's not it's not assimilable by the the by the environment at all mm -hmm. understand yeah okay and the commission is doing a study right now on oxo degradable on this oxo degradable so which yeah. is not uh, not uh, the real uh, um, yes vanishing and uh, wishful uh, plastic we want to have so one last question. I also uh, encourage our participants uh, to write some questions if there are, if not my last question. What is the most burning question for you NGOs when you're talking with uh, commissions or with the EU Commission or governments? What should they do first as next step to uh, avoid that Europe runs in a next bioeconomy dilemma as it was with GMO and it, as it was with biofuels. So how could be this prevented? Maybe I, I start and then uh, Delphine can, can add to it. Um, I think as I pointed out there was a lot of attention around the feedstock issues and for us this is not the main priority. The main priority is really about how can we uh, make plastics, whether they are fossil-based or bio-based, fit into a circular economy? And uh, that uh, addresses the whole hierarchy of things about prevention, reuse, but in particular recycling. We acknowledge that recycling of plastics in general is a huge uh, a challenge, and you need to make sure that bioplastics doesn't 
complicate the situation but follow the same obligations. So there should not be disadvantage compared to fossil-based uh, uh, plastics, but they need to make sure that at some stage when they uh, reach a certain market share, they need to fulfill their producer responsibility schemes. So we need to make sure that those materials are not only used once but can circulate and uh, kept in value in the economy for a couple of life cycles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Carl. I think that was perfectly summarized, so I don't have anything to add. <laughs> yes. And how far is uh, the legislation in the EU about this point? About prevention, you mean? Prevention, oh. yes. Prevention, multi use, or even these uh, recycling systems open also for bioplastics? So we have uh, recycling targets, um, and we have now aspirational reuse targets in the packaging and packaging waste directive, uh, at least at, the, at this stage, uh, what was voted uh, two days ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have any prevention targets, for example. Uh, countries mm -hmm. have to come up with uh, national prevention plans, wa mm -hmm. waste prevention plans, but there is nothing really made in terms of prevention, except on plastic bags, where we have um, and we have amended the packaging and packaging waste directive to allow country to ban or tax plastic bags. Okay. Yeah. And because uh, what we are something that is quite problematic today is that because or thanks, depending on who you are, uh, to the single market rules, countries are not allowed to ban very problematic substances or uh, materials, and and sometimes they can clearly see that. There are some issues, for example, with microbeads, um, and they are, if they want to ban that, they have to notify the commission, and this is the trend for microbeads, but for other products, it's not they are not going to be uh, necessarily allowed to do it by the commission. Mm -hmm. There is one question now from our audience, Constance Isbrucker, she's asking, are NGO aware that oxo-degradable plastics are not bioplastics and do not biodegrade and therefore support a ban of oxos? Do you of support course. a ban? Yeah, yeah, of course. I was not I was not meant to 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 introduce any confusion, but as you were talking about uh, Asia, and it's a, it's a very hot uh, topic there. But we are fully aware that these are not biodegradable and these are not biobased. That's, that's clear, and we are fully supporting a ban of oxodegradable. Mm -hmm. There is currently uh, this new waste directive uh, in the pipeline. Is this favorite to bioplastics and what we are discussing, or could there be done more in the legislation currently underway in the European bodies? So, uh, what has been voted for the packaging and the packaging waste directive is sort of a encouragement to member states to to help the development of the bio-based materials but it's not targeting bioplastics uh, specifically mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what we say as NGOs is that at this stage if we don't put the right safeguard, safeguards uh, there could be potential problems by incentivizing the development uh, of bioplastics if we don't have sustainability criteria for feedstock and a clear uh, yeah clear certification scheme and and preventing all these false green claims so mm -hmm. there is some the safeguards to to put for us before really going for incentivizing and things that that needs to be done to prevent waste and that are not being done yet but mm -hmm. that might come with the plastic strategy at the end of the year uh -huh. there is a yeah, Carsten, please, yeah. yes. I think it's important to distinguish what do you put into legal provisions on waste treatment and what uh, can you do through other tools where you have, for instance, public procurement for certain uh, uh, applications like huge events, like uh, Delphine already said. So uh, when it comes to incentives, uh, we are against a, a general favor of bioplastics through a legislative framework like on waste, because we think whatever the feedstock is, they need to fulfill the same requirements. But right. if you're 
want to promote them for specific uses, you have instruments like public procurement where you can do that because you put into the same call for tender not only the criteria to use bio, uh, in this case potentially biodegradable uh, packaging, but you also require that it will be collected and treated in a composting plant that fulfills the mentioned standards uh, for okay. the treatment of it. Yeah. Right. There is another question. Thank you very much, Karsten and Delphine, for this uh, answering me, from also for clarification. Uh, Simon Frost, he's editor of Materials World, he asks, what for you are the most urgent obstacles that bioplastic materials themselves need to overcome? So aside from policy issues, in terms of material properties and production processes, what are the main obstacles and what can they do not to do that fossil fuel based plastics can? So what are the advantages of bioplastics in material features? Are there any? <laughs> It's difficult. The only example which comes to my mind is PET and PEF, where I think PEF has been developed because it's actually better for the uh, in its functionality for the purpose of uh, co containing uh, beverages. Liquids, um, yeah, carbon carbonized liquids, liquids. Yeah, yes, exactly. So um, that's one example. But uh, exactly there, I point out. I mean, the first exercise you need to do when you develop bio uh, materials. Uh, or bioplastics um, should be which are the functionalities you want to achieve and um, there you need to compete with the fossil ones and if you are better than the fossil ones then you already have, an, have a, a market advantage I would say but when it comes to the circular economy requirements we are really at this stage where we don't see except for the limited applications for composting um, that we see major adva um, or um, uh, major uh, advantages for bio-based in terms of recyclability or reuse compared to fossil ones. So that's why we say let's create a level playing field and encourage where it's possible the uptake of sustainable feedstocks to uh, uh, gradually move from the fossil-based uh, feedstock to more bio-based ones. Mm -hmm. We'll continue are key and they are defined independently of the feedstock. Absolutely. Will consumer maybe have to do uh, some, uh, well have to uh, accept some less comfort when it comes to a more circular economy? Do they, they need to change their lifestyle? <laughs> yeah, but we see it as both sides of the coin. It's not only a demand issue, it's also an offer issue. As uh, Delphine has pointed out, we have given up on a lot of um, um, reuse and return uh, systems, especially for um, beverages. And uh, that might be because people find it not convenient, but it might be also because just the industry went for the single use one because it can be scaled up more quickly. So I think it's not about comfort in the first place, it's about an offer of uh, services which are attractive for the consumers and then they will also choose the reuse options in terms of packaging for instance. Mm -hmm. Okay. And maybe in terms of, I mean, obstacles for the development, I think this feedstock issue is really important because right now we see that uh, some massive users of bioplastics are importing um, corn or, or potatoes or things like that from, from Latin America, for example. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, what's the point for a circular economy if we have to import this renewable feedstock from that far and it's actually like food crops it's not it's not residues it's really food crops so uh, I think the bioplastics industry should really look at more sustainable ways to 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 grow uh, the the raw material they need to produce bioplastics yeah indeed so a lot of technological questions, a lot of organizational questions, a lot of legislative questions need to be solved because before we can consume bioplastics in a safe way. Would this uh, bring your message in a nutshell? That sounds very restrictive, <laughs> but uh, you're right. I mean, it's it's the question. I think certain 
the biomaterials are at the threshold of being scaled up and that's exactly the crucial point. You can do a lot of experiments like Daphne said before on a small scale without doing much harm but if you want to mainstream that for certain applications, you need to be sure that you fulfill these uh, sustainability uh, requirements. And that's the crucial thing where I think it's less about a research issue, whether the material is good or bad. It's about is it fit for purpose on a mass right. scale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Delphine, do you want to have the last word? <laughs> no, I, th I think what we wanted to say has been said <clears throat> and <clears throat> sorry and really like for us the priority is before looking at substitution is really looking looking at prevention and reuse and and I mean plastic is an interesting material for some application but as Karsten said we really need to look at functionality and uh, and ensure that that yeah we go back to the source of the product and make it as sustainable as possible right very good. So I think we had a wonderful session together. I thank uh, our presenters, I thank the audience for being so patient with us uh, and uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, the session is recorded. It will be available on the Combibis website and also on YouTube. So and you can also um, ask us per mail, me per mail, if you want to have the full slides in a PP uh, PowerPoint modus, please uh, send me a mail to Sylvia Schreiber at Praxis.de we will hand over the uh, presentation to you. Thank you very much. The webinar on bioplastics is closed and stay tuned. We will come up with a new topic soon. Goodbye. <laughs>